Welcome everyone, a good Nerv Shabbos. Thank you so very much for joining me. As we begin, Be'ezus Hashem, Baruch Shech Yonu V'Kiyamanu V'Giyanu to the learning of the new Chumash once again of Shmais. And this is of course also uh, preparing for Pesach, which is uh, coming right around the corner as we learn about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and the birth of us, the Jewish people. And as always, we start with incredible Akaras HaToyv to TorahAnytime.com for uh, giving us this global platform to learn Torah together and to Chazak for uh, being Mepharsim this year all over. Uh, tonight's year is being sponsored uh, first by a special postal sponsorship, which is anonymous, and it's done with a very sweet reason, the, a anonymous husband is doing it in honor of his wife, Esther Basveta Tzivya, for all that she does, and to wish her a happy birthday. And may the two of them together have wonderful Shalom Bayis and Gezun Parnas and Nachas and Nesiyas Chayim. We also have another sponsor this week, Ruvain Levine, from Inwood, sponsoring this year in the occasion of the Bar Mitzvah of their son David. He should grow up to be a Yerushimayim, a Talmud Chacham, and have success in Ruchnius and Gashmius. And, very nice thing, Ruvain said he's a good friend of my son, Rav Nechemia Weiss, who's a Rebbe by, a crackerjack Rebbe by Rabbi Bender. So he's also doing it in appreciation of Nehemiah and their friendship. Well, what could be better than that? Uh, and let me mention that uh, to sponsor this year, we don't have a sponsor for next week. Sponsoring this year gives a person uh, a schus in a year that reaches uh, hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of people. Uh, I'm not just saying that. I don't like to say how many, but I've seen the statistics of DoraAnytime.com. And uh, it's, uh, you, 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 you could be assured that it's a ballroom full of people and uh, it's uh, all over the world. And that's just on TorahAnytime.com. This year is also aired on Kolol uh on Facebook, uh, eventually on Torah Communications Network, and also uh, to my digital subscribers. Uh, as I said, there are people that say they would love to have this year earlier during the week, so I record it uh, also on a digital recorder earlier in the week, so therefore I need the subscribers earlier in the week. Uh, I mean, I need the, the sponsors. If you would like to sponsor, it's 718-916-3100. 718 916 at AOL.com. Rabbi Moshe Mehwai, Staten Island at AOL.com, so you could text or email or even call. I'm not doing the share, please. And again, that number is 718 916 uh, th- I thank the sponsors that helped me in my efforts in Harbatas Taira. And if you want to become from those that s- get the email of the share earlier in the week, it's $26 a month. And the day I do the share, I send it out to the people. Uh, earlier in the week. Vatomarna ish mitzri hitzilanu miyad arayim. The daughters of Yisro, of Reuel, he had seven names, uh, told their father that an Egyptian man saved us from the shepherds. Now, why did they refer to Moshe Rabbeinu as an ish mitzri? So the simple explanation is, is that Moshe Rabbeinu disguised himself as an Egyptian because he was fleeing from Paro. He was a wanted Ivri, so he was fleeing from Paro, so he disguised himself as an Egyptian that he shouldn't be recognized as a wanted man. Interpol was already after him, so he, he disguised himself, and therefore since he was in Egyptian apparel, they said an Ish Ritzri. As a matter of fact, most of the Farshim say that that which it says that we didn't change our Jewish clothing, like we say in, in the uh, Haggadah, right, that we were distinguished even in Egypt, is from here. Because normally they were dressed as Ivrim, even when they were in slavery. 
Now, it's interesting, there is a medrash over here where uh, Moshe Rabbeinu says to Hashem, after Eskanan el Hashem, when he was unsuccessful in pleading to enter into Eretz Yisrael, so Moshe Rabbeinu said, Hashem, let me at least be like Yosef. He wasn't Zaycha to die in Eretz Yisrael, but he was buried in Eretz Yisrael. So let them at least take my body into Eretz Yisrael. So Hashem said, no, because when the daughters of Yisro described you as an Ish Mitzri, you didn't protest. And since you didn't protest and say, no, no, don't call me an Ish Mitzri, I'm a Jew, therefore you're not Zeichet to be buried in Eretz Yisrael. It's a very powerful medrash. Because this means that Hashem expects us to defend our Jewish identity. We should never refer to ourselves as an American Jew. A Jewish American, maybe. But not an American Jew. We're not an American first. He, he, he should protest when he was referred to as an Ish Mitzri. But there's even a more uh, practical side to this lesson. And that is that, you know, there are some people that still till today try to work without a yarmulke. Now, of course, th there are times, as Ramesha writes, where there's a heter for it. But we should be very proud that we're Jewish. And living in a society where people walk around with purple hair and nose rings and, and, and uh, uh, studs in their mouth, Right? We should be able to wear a yarmulke with pride. Because when a, we see that it's important to be proud of our Jewish identity. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't buried in Eretz Yisrael because he didn't protest when he was called an Ish Mitzri. Now there's another very important lesson over here. And that is a person's responsibility is very heavy. We're not only liable for what we say, we're also liable if we don't protest when we hear something incorrect. I mean, we find the very, very severe punishment of Yosef, that Yosef passed away 10 years earlier because when the Shvatim talked about Yaakov, they said five times, Avdecha Ovi, your servant, our father. And he heard it five times from them and five times from the interpreter. And therefore he lost for each time a year because they referred to his father as Avdecha. Yosef didn't say anything. Of course he was keeping up the masquerade that he wasn't their brother. So it wasn't easy for him to protest. But even so he's held liable to the point of losing life because he didn't protest in hearing something incorrect. Now that means, let me, let me make this practical to your ears. That means that if you're sitting and you're listening to a conversation and somebody says about your father or your mother, yeah, they're not such practical people. Or, you know, they're getting older already, you know and you don't protest, you're held liable for not protesting the honor of your parents. Now that's even if you keep quiet. Yosef just kept quiet. Of course, if you nod your head in acquiescence, yeah, 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 and again, very you know, that's, that's even more severe. And I, I'm going to make this even more practical. If you're, if, let's say there's a woman She's sitting with her friends. And the friends say, yeah, yeah, your husband's such a nice guy, but he's a little bit, you know, he's a little bit lazy. And the wife is quiet. Just quiet. That's already a big liability. If she nods her head sheepishly and says, yeah, that's not one of his milers, that's being a traitor to her husband. A husband that does that to a wife is being a traitor to his wife. And that's what we learn from here. It's a very important lesson that it's not just what we say, 
just being quiet in front of something incorrect is already a crime. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't buried in Eretz Yisrael because of such crime, and Yosef HaTzadik passed away 10 years earlier. By the way, this crime is cited also about the Jews at the time of Hanukkah. The Jews at the time of Hanukkah, with Antiochus, it says that they played in the, uh, in the uh, Olympic theaters of ancient Greece, they played without clothing. And the Jews also wanted to compete. That was considered the great pride of the day. And it says they were embarrassed of their mila, so they pulled down the skin to disguise their mila. And again, that was considered a tremendous crime to be ashamed of their Judaism. Now, once we're on the subject of the burial of Moshe Rabbeinu, I want to share with you a Yalkit Ruveni, which is extremely difficult. I first saw this Yalkut Ruveni in Rev. Label Katz's Sefer on Chumash. Well, I'm going to be quoting this, e this evening because I broke it out because I miss him so much. And I saw that although my oil aria is all marked up uh, from all the times I've quoted him, every time I say something over, I put the year that I say it over from. But uh, for some reason, I didn't use it for Shmais. And I think about it, the devastating loss to Klal Yisrael that we lost Rev. Label Katz, who was so active. He was about to begin his seventh cycle, I believe, of Dafa Yoimi. I was by the CMHS together with him, dancing just before Corona. What a loss. Oh, he should be a Melitz Yosher for his family, for his Kehillah, for his Talmidim, for all of us, that we should be gesund and have Atzlocha, and the B.S. Geld Tzedek should come and the Trias HaMesim, the Mayor of Yameinu. So I originally saw this Yalkut Ruveni, he brings it down in his Sefer, that it says, the Yalkut Ruveni says, you know why Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't buried in Eretz Yisrael? He wasn't buried in Eretz Yisrael because he was the child of a Isser Erva, although it was permitted before Matan Taira, but since his father married his aunt, Yocheved was Amram's aunt, therefore he wasn't able to be buried in Eretz Yisrael, which is difficult because if that's the case, then how could Yosef be buried in Eretz Yisrael? He was also the... Uh, a child of a forbidden erva, because Yaakov married his mother, Rachel, second, so Rachel was Achais Ishtay. That's what it says. That's why she passed. That was, that's why she wasn't buried in the Marsa Bachpela. But the Mice is Yosef was a product of Achais Ishtay, which is an, also after Matantar and Issacharis, and yet he's buried in Eretz Israel. So, unless you want to make a, a, a difference between uh, capital crime that's mis Besden, but I don't know why you should make such a difference. So this is a very difficult to understand Yalkut Ruveni. But now let's look at a, another level of the layer of this Pasik. Ish Mitzri Hitzilano Miyad Harayim. And the Medrish explains that the daughters of Yisrael told him an uh, Egyptian man saved us from the shepherds. And the Medrash says the deeper meaning, and perhaps they didn't even know, Nisnab of any idea ma niba, niba of any idea ma niba, it was the Egyptian that Moshe Rabbeinu killed because he was starting up with the Jew that caused us to be saved. Because otherwise, Moshe Rabbeinu wouldn't be here in Midian. He would have been. Uh, hundreds of miles away in Egypt. He wouldn't be here. He was only here because since he killed the Egyptian and he was condemned to death and Paro tried to kill him and he had to run, so he ran to Midian and he was precisely positioned over here at the right time to save us from the Rayim. It says, the gam dola dola lonu is that the Rayim already had threw them in the water and they were drowned and Moshe Rabbein would save them. So he was here in the nick of time because of the Egyptian that he killed and he had to flee 
So therefore, Ish Mitzri, indirectly, the Ish Mitzri that Maish Rabbeinu killed, and therefore he had to be a, a fugitive in Mid- Midian, Hitzilanu Miyad Harayim. Now it's interesting that Rav Katz in the Oyel Aryeh learns that this is to teach us how far our Karas Atayv goes. That we should be grateful to the Ish Mitzri that caused us to be saved. However, I think that in this case, that's a very difficult pshat. How could any gratitude be directed to this Mitzri who violated a Jewish woman? It says that Shlomo Spas Divri uh, offered him Shalom, and he came to her in the night. He first he lured the husband uh, for work out of the house. He came to her, she didn't know, and he violated her. And now when the husband found out, so the, he was beating the husband, and uh, the best defense is offense. And Maishu Rabbeinu saw it and killed him. And some say, some Rishonim say that that's why he killed him. He killed him because he violated a Jewish woman. So here's a man who violated an Aishas Ish, then started beating up the husband. From this forbidden union, came the Mekalel, who later on had to be executed. And uh, by the way, when it says, Vayifun Kai Vekai, that Moshe Rabbeinu, since he killed him with the shame, Hamafoyrish, Halakhergeni, Atta Eimer, Eimer, so he killed with the shame, Hamafoyrish, so it had to be like Hashem, to see that no good person would ever come out from him. And he saw that Vayakhi there would be no loss, no good person would come out from him. That was including the Mekalel, who, who later would be executed in the, in the Midbar, who wasn't good. So this worthless man, right, it's hard to say that it says it to have a Koros to him. Now, if you have to have a Koros to him, then you would have to have a Koros also to Dasan and Aviram, because Dasan and Aviram was also a Gairim, because they're the ones that slandered Moshe Rabbeinu to Paro, and because of that, Moshe Rabbeinu was discovered and had to flee. Rather, I think that there is something else going on. Now, I will tell you that I know Rav Katz is probably basing it on, there's an Or Yohel that says that Moshe Rabbeinu was afraid of Oig because Vayavoy HaPolit, uh, the refugee who was Oig, came and told him about Light being taken captive. So Avram Avinu saved him, and that saved Malchus based David, who came from Light. And even though Oig didn't have good reasons, it says that he wanted Avram to go and, and try to rescue and die, and then he would take the beautiful Sarah as a wife. So even though he had diabolical reasons, that's different. At the end, he didn't take Sarah. And at the end, he didn't cause Avram to die. But at the end, he did say Malchus based David. So there, there's a reason for Maisha Rabbeinu to be scared of that merit when he fought with Basha. But here, this man did terrible things. He violated an Asia's Ish. He was beating the husband. He did terrible things. I think that there's a different issue over here. When it says, Ish Mitzri Yitzilonu Miyad Arayim, the Torah is saying that Moshe Rabbeinu had reason to be frustrated. Here he had a very, very comfortable position in the palace of uh, Paro. He had an opportunity to manipulate things for the sake of all of the Jewish people, as he did by gra- getting them a, sh- a day off on Shabbos. And he was able to go out for Yarbis Sivloisam and share in their burdens. And he was able to be clandestinely connected to his family, to Yecheved and Miriam, through Bisya. And he had connection with the wonderful Bisya. And now he was ripped away. He would end up being a king by the Kushim for 40 years. He would end up being in jail 10 years, all because of this uh, miserable Mitzri. So he might be frustrated. So the Torah says, don't be frustrated. It's only because of the Mitzri that you got your Shidduch. Ish Mitzri, it's Ilanim It's only because of the Ish Mitzri that your wife, Tzipara, was saved and you were brought. How would you get your Bashar to Tzipara? You know, there's a Rabbeinu Ephraim, and it's also a Paneach Raza. They both say that uh, Tzipora is exactly 375. 
Uh, that's without the Vav. Tzipora is 375. It's exactly Begamatria Limosha. She was a ten in the intended one, Limosha. And therefore, how would, you, how, how would it ever happen that you would be a Midian? Otherwise, you would have never set foot in Midian in your life. And here your intended is supposed to be in Midian. So you should know that which happened to the Mitzi, don't fret. That was what led you in order to get the, your intended in Midian. That's the way Rabbi Nishon does things. right? He made a famine, and the famine brought down Avram Avinu to Mitzrayim. And there Avram Avinu found Hagar, and Hagar caused that Yitzhak should be born, right? Because it was in Schuss that Sarah took Hagar as a rival, that they had Yitzchak. That's why Hagar and Yitzchak are the same gematria. So this is showing us how uh, things happen for our benefit. By the way, we're talking about the name Tzipora, which is gematria Lemaisha. The Chida also points out, we know Shmo Gorim, that in a name is embedded the big things that a person does in their life. For example, Bullock, he was the king that hired Bilaam to curse Kal Yisrael. Those curses became blessings. Right? Matovo, Alech, Al Yaakov. Right? But Bullock is the same letters as Likov, to curse. Because his whole yichas in the world was to hire Bilaam to curse Kal Yisrael. Just like Ephraim, his yichas is that Piran, he took, he exacted payment, Ephron is the same letters as Piran, for Aphoron, for earth, and Ephron, without the, the Vav, is 400, because he took Abameh, Shekel, Kesef. So in the name Tzipora, says the Chida, Tzipora is Tzar Pehe. Why? Because she took the Tzar, the rack, right? Pehe is Bigamatria 85, is exact Gematria of Mila. She took the Tsar to do the Mila on, uh, on, on Moshe Rabbeinu's child, on their child, because otherwise the snake would have killed Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's why she was called Tsipora, because she was Rutz Ketsipor. She had alacrity, because if she didn't run, Moshe Rabbeinu would have been swallowed by the snake. It's interesting that Tsipora is, was very beautiful. She was called an Isha Kushis. It means that she stood out. She stood out like a Kushis. She stood out in her beauty. It, she could have been, the letters of Tzipora are the same letters as Prutza. Because she could have been a Prutza. But instead, it says that she was tar like a Tzipor. Because the tzipor is an example of tahira, says the Medrash, as it says in the Pasik, called tzipor tahira techelu. So it's an example of tahara. She was an amazing woman. Now we have to understand that Moshe Rabbeinu, it says that he saved her from drowning. Mida Kineg and Mida, she saved him from being swallowed by the snake. It's Mamish Mida Kineg and Mida. And it also says that when Moshe Rabbeinu was in the jail for 10 years, she risked herself and took care of him for 10 years when he was in the, the jail. By Yishmael and Kimes Nakosam, Hashem heard their cries. By Yishmael and Kimes Brisai, and Hashem remembered the covenant as Avram, as Yitzchak, as Yaakov. So again, I is today, I have four volumes of the Ayel Arye on Bereshis. I don't have a fifth volume. I'm still hoping maybe there are manuscripts and one day the family will bring it out. But how, how, how the world misses Rev. Label Katz. A true Evet of Hashem. So in Oyel he brings down uh, a pshat on this Pasuk from the Chazayn Yecheskel. The Chazayn Yecheskel says that the Pasuk says two things. Vayishma Elikim Es Nakosam. And then it says, Vayizker Elikim Es Brisoy Es Avram Es Yitzchak Ves Yaakov. So the Chazayn Yecheskel says that if it would only be from the screams and the cries of Klal Yisrael, we wouldn't have got out of Mitzrayim. We wouldn't have got, we're supposed to go be there for 400 years. It just 
it would have alleviated the harsh labor. But the memory of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, uh, the skus of the Ovas HaKadoshim, allowed that we should be taken out of Egypt. So it's the skus Ovas that's very powerful. So on this Chazan uh, Yecheskel, Rav Katz adds that that's why the first bracha of Shemayin Esrei is so critical. Right? There's Allah in Shulchan Ach, that if you don't have a kavana in the first bracha of Shemayin Esrei, of the bracha of, of Avais, you really should have to say Shemayin Esrei over again. Just, probably won't have kavana anyway the next time. So the Ramah says we don't do it. And the the, the the uh, Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yisif Kairai, says that it doesn't say that, but it says that even the Svardim, they also don't say it over, they go with this Ramah, because you probably won't have Kavana the second time either. They used to say about the, the, the Kaddish, Rav Moshe's Edim, Rav Shizkal, that if he wouldn't have Kavana the first time, he would have to say over Shman Esrei. If those who remember his, his, his palpable Kavana, Shama Shiram and Aliyah, Rav, Rav Shizkal, Anyway, so Rav Level Katz, Zechtav Kosh Baruch Tzchusi Yogan Aleinu, writes that it's because of the importance of the Tzchus Avos. That's why we have to have in mind when we say Elikei Avram, Elikei Yitzhak, Elikei Yaakov, we're talking, we're invoking the schus of us. That's very powerful, as the Chazon Yechezkel said. We went out because of the schus of Ram Yitzhak Yaakov. By the way, as to why you're not Yitzhi, if you don't have Kavon in the first bracha, Rav Miller says a different shot. Rav Miller says, when we take the three steps forward, we're entering into the palace of the Melech Malchei Amloch. But you know, a palace, you want to get into the White House, La Havdal. you just can't get in. You have to show your identity card. You have to have an appointment. You can't just get in. Now that's the White House. Uh, imagine the palace of the King of Kings. You just can't get in. You have to have a password. Ah, the password is Elikei Avram, Elikei Yitzhak, Elikei Yaakov. Ooh, a chosh of a descendant of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. The doors swing open. It says your Miller. But if we don't say the password, we're left outside. You're left outside the rest of the Shemayin Esrei. What does it help? You never got in Tashem. That's why it's so important to have Kavani in the password. That's the way Rav Miller learns. You have to say the password. Vayoymru alekeha ivrim nikra aleinu. The God of the Jews appeared before us and called to us and asked that nelcha no derech shloishis yomim midbar that we should go a trip of three days in the desert, and offer sacrifices to Hashem our God. Now, uh, the Rav of Carmel asks Akasha, which is a Pasha to Kasha. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky asks the Kasha. Many of the Mephoshim ask the Kasha, and that is, why all the subterfuge? They weren't asking just for a three-day trip. They wanted to leave. They wanted to go to Eretz Yisrael. That was the promise to the other Sakadashim. So why did Maish Rabbeinu say, you know, let them go for three days? Well, you know, he should ask, listen, you're, you're imprisoning an entire nation illegally. This is a nation that saved Mitzrayim. As Paro said, uh, don't you know that our land is, you know, uh, uh, it's gone. The famine devastated the land. The food that the Egyptians saved didn't stay. It rotted. It was only because of Yosef HaTzadik that the land was saved. We're the descendants of Yosef. We saved Mitzrayim. Why are you enslaving us? We want to go to our homeland. Let us go. Let my people go. What's this business of three days? You know, Chaysamay Shal HaKadosh Baruch Hu Emes. Why is the Rabbi Nishalom telling them to prevaricate. So, the simple answer to this question is that it was the plan that Paro should be lured after them to chase them. Because he could righteously say, you said you're coming back in three days. And uh, you didn't. 
I'm going to chase you, and then chase them, and he'll go to the watery grave. Nine million Egyptians would go to the watery grave. Mida connecting Mida for drowning Jewish babies. They drowned in the Yam. Also, the Riva, who asked this question, says simply that they wouldn't be able to ask loans for the silver, the gold, and the clothing if they weren't coming back. It says, Vayashilam, you should ask for a loan. And the Yismach Moshe says it's really not technically a lie. Because there's a klal in Shas, Michlal Mosayim Mona. Included in 200 is 100. So the same thing over here. They said we're going to go for three days. Yeah, we're going to go for three days. We're going to go longer than three days. But it's not technically a lie because that's the way the Yismach Moshe learns. However, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, who we know his whole life, he puts so much emphasis on truth. It's so interesting that they asked my Rebbe Ramosha, Bameharachta Yomim, in what merit did you live long? So, of course, Ramosha could have said that he learned every moment of his life. I know I was in the for 10 years. I never saw him idle. Even when Tisha B'Av fell on on Shabbos, where people are makbed Erev Shabbos not to learn after Chatzos, he was checking the galleys of his new svarim. And he told me this is not official learning. He was checking for mistakes. He was always learning. Whether it was Mishnayis when he took off his tefillin, when it was Tanakh when he was waiting for the karyo. But, but he wanted to give people something that they could sink their teeth into. So Ramayisha said, Man gans lebin, my whole life I never caused pain to another person. So they asked Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky the same question. He also lived into his 90s. So he said his whole life he didn't tell a lie and he tried never to hurt a person's feelings. There's a story about Rabbi Yaakov. There's different versions of this story. This is one of the versions. There's a story that when he was young, he was eight kes. That was the minig that, you know, the yeshivas, until yeshivas kachme leblin, the yeshivas didn't have kitchens. So where did the bachram eat? They were given to different families, and those families gave food to yeshiva bachram. Some families gave them, uh, you know, macaroni six days a week. And other families treated uh, a yeshiva bacha like a king. I remember that when I was learning in yeshiva, there was a family that, I, I didn't eat the yeshiva food so much. I was finicky. So there was a family that when I became so hungry, because I only went home once a month, I became so hungry, I called them up, and I remember they used to serve me a steak meal. And it was Mechayami. I found out many years later that this family didn't eat steak. They only had steak in their freezer just for me. What, a, what an extraordinary thing. So there were families that gave kest that they treated the yeshiva bach like a visiting king. Man malke rabbanan, right? So anyway... They, for Pesach, they told Rabbi Yaakov to go to this and this house. So Rabbi Yaakov came in, and he took one look at the Pesach preparations, and he didn't feel it was up to his standards of kashrus. Maybe the, the, the counters weren't covered properly, whatever. But what's he going to do? Here's a family that wants to support a, a Shiva Bacher, and he's going to say it's not up to his standards. I mean, that, uh, he would never do such a thing. So he asked them, do they eat gebrocks? And they said, yes. So he says, oh, he is a mistake. I don't eat gebrocks. That was his way to wiggle out. The fact of the matter is, he did eat gebrocks. But from that day onward, he never ate gebrocks. In order that it shouldn't be a lie, even though he did it because he wanted to, to have a higher standard of kashas. So Rabbi Yaakov was very sensitive to Emes. So Rabbi Yaakov says like this, when Moish Rabbeinu said, that we should go three days, his plan was, Hashem's plan was, taka only three days. And I found it's a Ramban. Rabbi Yaakov's shot is Mamish in the Ramban. 
the Ramban says it was a three-day trip to Har Sinai. And by the way, the Nel Kedar Derech Shosh Yom really means six days. It's three days there and three days back. But what he was saying is as follows. We know that in Mitzrayim, in Eretz Shtufei Zima, a land steeped in promiscuity and witchcraft, we know that we can't last long. We would sink to the 50th degree of Tumah. Like it says, Bachatzais. We had to leave Bachatzais exactly at midnight. If we were stayed a moment longer, we wouldn't have been worthy to be redeemed. So Rav Zalman Saratskin asks, wait a second. You're in Mitzrayim, 210 years, the second lady you wouldn't have been worthy to be redeemed. We're in Gauls now thousands of years. How are we worthy for the Gula? So Rav Zalman Saratskin says the difference is with the Torah. That was in Mitzrayim, we didn't have the Torah. Without the Torah, we can't survive more than 210 years. It's like a Arachaim HaKadosh. The Arachaim HaKadosh says, V'loi shamu al Maisha mikaitze ruach umeavayda kasha. The Jews didn't listen to Maisha mikaitze ruach umeavayda kasha. Says the Arachaim HaKadosh, Ulai mipnei she'enam b'nei Taira. But with the Taira, we were able to tolerate even very harsh conditions. People were able to survive very harsh conditions. So with the Taira, so the plan originally was to go a three-day tip to Sinai and come back with the Taira. Then we would stay for 400 years like the, the Pashtas of the Brisbane Abbasar. Only Paro didn't listen and he waited till the last second where Bakat Saisa was already too late. We had to get out of there, otherwise we would have sank. In the Mapic Margolius, it's a new safer that I got this year, the Mapic Margolius says another interesting thing. You know, you see, I am punim latera. So interesting. The Mapic Margolius says that the three days was not because of Paro. The three days was because of the Yidden. The Yidden were still slaves. Slaves, the children of slaves. They had a slave mentality. They weren't ready to leave Egypt. They weren't ready to be on their own. We see four-fifths died because they didn't want to leave Egypt. If Moshe Rabbeinu said, we're leaving, they wouldn't have gone. The three days was for the benefit of the Yid, and what an interesting way of looking at things. So when Paro heard that Moshe Rabbeinu is asking to go to a convention a spiritual convention in the, he went livid. He said, what? You're thinking about spiritual? I, I thought he stamped that out of you. Religion is the opium of the people. He said, oh, that means they have time to think? Oh, you, I'm not giving them this Shabbos anymore. They have time to sit and think and to read things. I'm not giving them straw anymore. Let them work harder. Right, the Yosuba, they let, let them work, work, work. Val Yeshu I don't want them to have time to think. The Masil Sisharim tells us that the Parshiyos of Shmois and the personality of Paro has to be learnt on different levels. And on one level, the Masil Sisharim says, Paro is a symbol of the Yetzirah. And the study of Paro is a study into the machinations, the tachbulois of the Yetzirah. And he says this is one of the biggest ones. And that is that the Yetzirah gets a person to be so busy that they don't have time to think about whether they're doing what's right, whether they're doing what's wrong, whether they're prioritizing, whether they're fulfilling their responsibility to their most important relationships, to their spouse, to their parents, to their children. Just busy, 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 busy. So he said, Tirpala, they have to be more busy. There's a story that the Pyrian Shlomo brings down. Uh, in Siberia, one of the most cruelest uh, labors 
was that they had people chopping wood in minus 40 degree weather. And the, the combination of sweating and chopping in such frigid weather, Mamish killed people. So there was a, a carpenter who went to the uh, authorities and said that he could make the wood much more efficient. He could create a saw that could be handled with by two people that would make the job more efficient. So they said, by all means. So he uh, created such a saw and they finished their work three hours earlier and it brought relief for two weeks. After two weeks, uh, a decree came from Moscow that they should produce double the amount of wood. So the carpenter was all uh, in, uh, up in arms. Uh, I, I, I invented something and now you're punishing me for what we did? So they arrested him and they put him in jail. So one of his friends visited him in jail and said, well, how did you end up in jail? So he was righteously indignant. And he said, look, I did something for the benefit of Mother Russia, and they punished me for it. So the man looked at him and said to him, you're so naive. You think they need the wood? They don't need the wood. They just want us to work every minute that we don't have time to think to rebel. They don't need the wood. They just want to work us every minute that we don't have time to think. And that's what Paro was doing. That's what the Eight Sahara does. You know, a person, if they have time, they'll think, am I spending enough time with my spouse? What is it like being married to me? Do, do, do I visit my parents? Do I call them? Do I spend time with my children? You know, am I am I am I learning enough? I mean, that's that's everything. You know, am I am I am I am I doing mitzvahs? Did I learn the meaning of davening? The Yitzchak doesn't want us to have time to think about this, so he keeps us busy. So he has different ways to keep us busy. One of his best ways is money. People have such a love of money that if they have more time, they want to make more money. They have more time, more money. It's not that it's enough. There's never enough. What do you mean? It's not enough. I need for a rainy day, then I need it for a snowy day, then I need a rainy day for my children, and then I need a rainy day for my grandchildren, you know, and then I want to become a multimillionaire. So money is one of the ways that the Yetzirah is tich bara avoid ala nashim, that they shouldn't think. But today, he, the Yetzirah created a new weapon. It's called the smartphone. Because once there's a smartphone, we never have time to think. What do you mean? I, I, if I have time, I go on the phone and I scroll. And I have Instagram, and I have Facebook, and I have YouTube, and there's always something interesting. There's always an excuse. Yeah, it's good to know this, and it's good to know that. Yo, it tells, it tells you, I always wondered about this, and I always wondered about that. Oh, and, and, and who has time to think anymore? Today, the Yetzara has many ways to accomplish this. Another way that the Yetzara has is movies and television. There's, you could, there's a word called binging. You could binge on a show. You could spend a Sunday. Used to be, if there was a show that you liked, it would come once a week. So you, you see it an hour. Then you have to wait for the next week. But now, you could, they have it all together. And you could watch 11 shows in one day. So you could binge the whole day. And then you could binge on a different show. And somebody says, binge on this show. And, and, and who has time to think anymore? Or there's a person that's so into the computer games that if he has a second, she has a second, they're into the games or into the connecting or they're, they're busy with um, the chats. Right? So I, I got, oh, I don't want to miss. There's night people, there's day people. Uh, they're, they're expecting to hear from me. There's in the middle of the night people, there's early morning people. 
I, I, they got to hear from me. They always hear from me. I, they want to hear my opinion, my sage opinion. It's interesting. Rabbi Shamshir Rufal Hirsch says that this world is called Eretz because of ruts. Everybody's running from cradle to grave. And that's the wiles of the eight Sahara. He says, I don't want you to have time. You have time to think. So this way, I give you this phone. It's going to attach itself to you like a, like a maggot, like a leech. It's going to hold on to you. And then, <laughs> you know, even couples that go out to a restaurant together, they hold their phones by them and they're on the phones. They're not even talking to each other. They sit down in the house. There's a phone next to them. Excuse me, I got to do this. I got to look at this. It's like being kind of, the, the phone becomes an odd in Lazmacha. That's what Paro says. That's, that's, don't have, it says, Limnos Yomenu Kain Hoda. If you know how to count your days, Vinovi Levav Chachma. That brings to a heart of wisdom. So I, I, I heard from Rev. Irving Bun, Bunim. What's Pshat Limnos Yomenu Kain Hoda? It's no big Chachma to know your birthday, to know how old you are. So Rebbe Irving Bunim says, when you see a sign on the New York Thruway or on the 17, and it says 120 miles to Binghamton, it doesn't tell you how many miles you traveled, it tells you how many miles you have left. So yeah, it says, Yemeish Noiseinu Bem Shivim Shona. Uh, 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 the average lifespan is 70. And if we're Zaycha to Gvurus, it's 80. So a person is 67. So he says he's 67 years old, but in Lois Yamenu Kain Haida, he has only three years left to 70. He only has 13 years left to 80. Ooh. Ooh, that shakes a person's up. That's why Lois Yamenu Kain, Kain Bigmatri is 70. That brings to a heart of wisdom. What's Chachma? He's a Chachma Reyes on Eilid. Have to plan, have to plan for the next world. That's what it says. Uvnei Yisachar, the Shevet of Torah, Yoyde Bina Le'itim. They understood time. I to understand time. Or it says, Shavuos, Shavuos is Shabai Ace. It's the purpose of time, Torah. That's the famous song of the Ibn Ezra. He wrote a poem. Adam Dayeg. The Ibadamov, a person worries about the loss of his money. He doesn't worry about a wasted Sunday. When it comes later on, at the end of a person's life, Damov, Damov, Enam Aizrim. The money doesn't help. Yamov, Yamov, Enam Chaizim. All those wasted days don't come back. Days. The most precious commodity is time. That's what we say. You know, it says in this week's Parsha that. Uh, the maidens of ba- Basia were holchais al yad hayar, right? The narois were holchais al yad hayar. The 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 ladies in waiting of the queen of the princess Basia were walking. So it says that a malak came and killed them, except for one, because they would have stopped Basia from taking Moshe out of the Nile. And Rashi says, how do we know that Holchus means that they died? Because it says uh, that Esav said, I'm going to die. So the Mepharshim say, why is Holchus, why does it have any connection to dying? Because every step we take, we're getting closer to death. We're actually going to the grave. Every step we take, we're going, every Pesia that we take, we're going straight at, closer and closer to the grave. Now, that's a morbid thought. But we know that Yizkel Oyem Amisa, thinking about death, gets us to prioritize and use our time correct, correctly. Uh, Rabbi Nisham is going to reward a person. He's going to ask a person, how did you treat your wife? Person is, the Torah is going to ask a woman, I made you to be an Ezer Kenegdai. Were you an Ezer? Did you live your life as an Ezer? Tchilas Use time correctly. Because the Yetzirah tries us to get us so busy that we don't have time to think. 
Am I using my time correctly? Hovon is Chakmalai. Come, let's deal wisely with him. This was the final solution against the Jews. Pen Yerba, lest they increase, they're having six at one, at six each time. Before you know it, there'll be more Jews than Egyptians. So the Satmar Rebbe, the Hele Gedivre Yoel, Zechot Tzav HaKadosh Lebracha, Skusa Yagen Alein, he says, Hovo is a Loshon HaChana. We know that he, the final solution was to throw them, to drown them in the water. Paro says, let's see, how can we kill them? Oh, he promised that he won't bring a flood, so he won't be able to do Mida Kenegen Mida. And even Paro believed in Mida Kenegen Mida. So we'll, so to speak, hamstring Kaviyochel Hashem. So, but what was the Hovo? What was the Achana for this? The Divrei Yoyal says, Paro, if he would have said drown Jewish babies, the, the Egyptian populace would look at, at him in horror. What is he, a Meshuggah? A murderer? So first he made Pitam and Ramses, that we had to build the pyramids. And then it was Avedis Perech. It was work day and night that made us crumble. Oh, once he got the Egyptians used to, Tsugavint, to cruelty, then he was able to say genocide. Kalabene Yilar and the Sama Rebbe is showing, he didn't say this, but I'm adding, this was exactly what the Nazis, Yemach Shemam V'Zichram, did. If Hitler, Yemach Shemai, L'Deirai in Eilam, would come first with gas chambers, 12,000 Jews a day, they would have said he's a madman. So first he made the Nuremberg Laws, stripping Jews of being doctors, of owning businesses. Then he made them we're stars. Then he put them in ghettos. After treating us like vermin, then he was able to say uh, uh, extermination. And then, then treating us subhuman, then he could exterminate us. It's interesting that Rav Shach explains from one Chad Bedara to another Chad Bedara. That Rav Shach says that the Achana was is first Paro had to take away the schus tire by getting everybody to work and taking them away from this Gemara and Peter and Ram says avoid this parach. Then he was able to attack. So that's why Shevet Levi he couldn't. As briskly and Sarah, they never stopped learning. They didn't even come the first day to work. So then Shevet Levi was not uh, uh, like Moshe Rabbeinu was told. Lechula simply say, "Come go to your work." They weren't enslaved. So that was also the Nazis. As Rav Moshe Shara writes in his Sefer, he writes that the, uh, the, the Jews, uh, Hitler first targeted the Rabbiner. First the Rabbiner. Because he knew that that was the Kayach, the lifeblood of Klal Yisrael. Vayakutsum ipnei b'nei Yisrael. And the, the Jews were disgusting. They were, they, they were nimus to the Egyptians. We were like thorns. And we know that the Rabbi Nishan made this because otherwise they would have molested us. They, they, they had us under their control. That we, we were completely their slaves. If they would have had a, a taiva, like here, Sora came down to Egypt. She was right away abducted. So how could it be there were millions of Jews? How could it be that the only Jewish woman ever that was molested was Shlomis Bas Divri? And it says, Mishpachas Haruveni, right? Hagodi. It says Hashem was Meshat, the hay of his name in the beginning, in the Yud at the end. Shem Kot to be made that Shifte Kot, Edus Yisrael, that we were not molested. Right? We, were, we were like a, 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 a ganol. We were locked. We, were, we weren't molested. But how could that be? So Rabbi Nishal made it that we should be disgusting in the eyes of the Bnei Yisrael. It's interesting. The Rambam writes that the purpose of the Mila is to be matish, is to weaken the lust in a person. And the Arizal says that the Mila with the Priya uh, helps a person not be over 
in his Suri Arayas. And therefore, when it came the time that the Bnei Yisrael stopped mauling themselves, they assimilated. Kishemais Yosef, hey, Feiru bris mila, Amru niya kimitzriyem. So immediately then, they had more of a desire for the Egyptians because they stopped circumcising. So therefore, the Rabbi Nisham went out and uh, made it the other way around, that the Egyptians shouldn't want us. Hopach libam lisna yamoy. Hashem changed their heart to hate us. It's interesting that there's a famous kasha. The, it says that when Yosef was the minister of agriculture, so the Jews, when, the Egyptians, when they ran out of food, they went to Paro. And Paro said, what are you coming to me? Go to Yosef. So they said, no, Yosef wants us to mal ourselves. And we're afraid because we heard of that trick before. That's what happened to Shrem, and then, then, then Shrem got wiped out. So we're afraid. So Paro laughed at them. Tell me, you knew about the famine. Didn't you put away food? They said, yes. So what happened? Our food spoiled. So he said, your food spoiled. Yosef's didn't. You think he has to res resort to trickery if he wants to get you? Go and do what he wants. So the Egyptians circumcised themselves. Shaila is, why did Yosef want the Egyptians to circumcise themselves? We don't ask Goyim to circumcise themselves. So the Toysis of Rosh and Chumash says at Mechudosh Tekepshat that Yosef was concerned that they were from the Bnei Keturah down in Mitzrayim and he held that the Bnei Keturah being children of Avram had to uh, circumcise themselves. That's why he did it. But the Maral says that he did it because of reverse worry about assimilation. Yosef correctly uh, saw, forecasted, that the Jews would want to be like the Egyptians. So therefore he had uh, the Egyptians circumcise themselves, so they shouldn't, the Jews shouldn't be tempted not to circumcise. It was very good what Yosef thought, except it says, by Yochum el asher yodas Yosef, and Targum says, doloi mekayim gzeris Yosef, that power stopped the, the Egyptians from having to circumcise. So now the Jews, Taka, uh, uh, also didn't want to circumcise. But that was Yosef's reason for having them to circumcise. But I seen that the Divrei Yoyal, and again I saw this in the Yoyal Arye, that the Divrei Yoyal says that Yosef wanted them to circumcise to be machish, the lust of the Egyptians, so that they shouldn't want to be with the Yidden. Also an interesting reason. Every child that's born should be thrown in the water. The Gemara says in Sight the Yud Aleph that in this final solution of Havan Ishak there were three ministers uh, Bilam, Yisrael, and Eev. Bilam said, Kill them. And because of that, Bilam ben Ba'ar, Hargu Bacharav, he was killed by Pinchas. Yisrael ran away, and because of that, he was Zaycha, that his descendants sat in the Sanhedrin, the Lishan Sargazas, and Eev was quiet, and therefore he had terrible suffering. So, of course, the famous Kasha, this is something that everybody knows, but I want to bring out a contemporary point. The Grizz asks, what did Eev do wrong? He knew Paro wasn't listening, because even if it was one against one, Paro also wanted to kill them. So he knew he wasn't going to listen, so he might as well be quiet and be there at least to benefit the Jews. So the Grizz, Zeratzadik, the Rachas Chusiyog and Aleinu says, but when Yidin are suffering, you can't be silent. And if you're silent to their suffering, then Chas Vishalom, you'll also suffer. And this has such a contemporary application. Yidin are suffering now. People are gasping for breath with corona sickness. People there are husband and wife, young father and mothers in bed with corona. Their children can't go to yeshiva because they're quarantined. Their children are running around in the house. Their parents can't even take care of them. There are breadwinners that died and families are out of Parnassa. Young Yesayimim. There are Kehillahs without Rabbanim who died. There are Hasidus where their Rebbes had died. There are huge, huge amounts of businesses that have been 
wiped out, whether hotel businesses, whether restaurant, whether catering. There, there have been stores that haven't been able to sell their goods. There's so much suffering in Israel and lockdown. It's all Parnassa, it's tourism, it, it, which has been wiped out. It's so much suffering. A person has to feel it. At least cry out to Hashem in Shmakaleinu, in Rafa'enu, in Sim Shalim. If not, how can a person not be thinking about these things? Really running up against the clock over here. Um, I have two more thoughts I want to share with you. First, again, I want to thank Torah Anytime.com. Chazak, I want to thank my wonderful sponsors, this Ruven Levine from Inwood, in honor of his son David's Bar Mitzvah, and our anonymous sponsor, in honor of his wife, Esther Bas Sveta Tzivya. She should have everything good and a happy birthday. And again, to ask you, please support this year by being a sponsor. Uh, people say, why don't I mention the amount? A postal sponsor is 540. A regular sponsorship is 360. We look for at least two sponsors a week. Um, to join my uh, digital subscribers, it's $26 a month. Either way, 718-916-3100, 718-916-3100, rmmwsi at aol.com. I try for my digital subscribers to record it either Monday or at the latest Tuesday, so please, if you could get this to me beforehand. Also, if you want to join my uh, Zoom Dafyaimi, we have new people joining us, Baruch Hashem, all the time. You go to, uh, on the internet, zoom.com, zoom.com, put in my ID, which is my phone number, 718-916-3100, 7.45 uh, on the New York Time, uh, at 7.45, Matzah Shabbos, two blot, throughout the week, 7.45 p.m., one blot, we'd love to have you. You should take this staff. So the Yalka tells us that this was no ordinary staff. This staff was created by Nashmoshes, Erev Shabbos, of Sheishes Yimei Abreshes. This was created at the beginning of time. And it was given to Adam in Gan Eden. Adam took it and gave it to Shane. Shane gave it to Avram, Avram gave it to Yitzchak, Yitzchak gave it to Yaakov, Yaakov gave it to Yosef. When Yosef passed away, he left it in the palace. Yisro saw it, he took it, he put it in the garden. It couldn't be removed until Moshe Rabbeinu took it and was granted Yisro's daughter Tzipporah. And this is the staff. Now this, this means that this staff connects the miracles of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, to the beginning of time. It bothered me why the Yalkut didn't say that Adam gave it to Noach. I didn't give it to Shem. No, excuse me, I skipped. Adam gave it to Chanoich, and Chanoich gave it to Shem. So why didn't Chanoich give it to Noach? I saw the Pirkei de Rebbe Lez, says Chanoich gave it to Noach, and Noach gave it to Shem. That means that this matter was in the Teva. It was in Gan Eden, it was in the Teva, and here it is in the hands of Moshe Rabbeinu. It has on it the Tzach Hadash Ba'achav. That just tells you the importance. In other words, the ten makas were from the beginning of time. They were already chokuked at this important display of Ashkocha Protis, of how Hashem wields creation for the sake of Yidin, was already at the beginning of time. That's how important the ten makas are. Now, why doesn't it say Amram took back your chevet? So, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says that this teaches us that unlike the Goyim, that they try to make their leader into the Son of God. No! Moshe Rabbeinu was a human from human parents. Now, on the simple level, the reason it doesn't say their names is because it, it's Mustafa that Amram and Yocheved got back together in a clandestine fashion, in secret. Because we know that Paro had a dream 
that there was one sheep that would outweigh the entire land of Egypt. And that sheep was the Moshiach and Shal Yisrael. He was trying to kill it. So who would the Moshiach and Shal Yisrael come from? Most likely from the leader of Klai Yisrael, from Amram and Yecheved. And especially if they have a child at 130, Yecheved was 130, that's a miraculous child, it would surely show that he would become the most wanted baby in Egypt. So therefore they did it secretly. Ishme be slavi ve'yikachas ba'slavi. It's also possible that it's Ishme be slavi ve'yikachas ba'slavi because it says that although Yocheved was 130, she became like a young girl. That's why she was a ba'slavi. Maybe Amram also, ve'yalchish, maybe he became young as well. And that would also explain, we said that he took his aunt, but since they miraculously became young again, maybe they were Kakot and Shinoila dummy, like different people. Now they ask another question over here, and that is, why isn't this mentioned as a miracle that she had a child at 130? Aaron at 127, Miriam at 124, Eldad and at 129. One answer they give is, is that the Torah only says miracles that were forecasted before. So sorry, Meinu, a year before it was forecasted, right? Since it was forecasted, it shows it's from Hashem. Here it wasn't forecasted. Another answer that they give is that since there were already so many miracles that they were having Shisha B'Keres Echad, every child, every young girl was having six tuplets, so there was already a lot of miracles with uh, giving birth, so it didn't stand out. Another answer they say is, is that since Sari Menu already opened up the doorway, myself a similar bonim for such a miracle, it wasn't considered such a miracle. The first time it was considered such a miracle. Okay, again, there's so much in this parsha. Even if I talk fast, you can't touch only a tiny little eensy weensy little bit. And I have Eilish Mice, the Balaturim. The Rabbi Nisraim says stands for the Chayiv Adam Lahashlam Aparsha Shnayim Mikra Vechatargam. That's what Veil Shmois. And in the time of Corona, who doesn't want the schooler of Marichin Lo Yama Vishnaisev? I. Why is it hinted to in Shmois? Why not in Bereshis? Amei Yeshme Rabba Vakol Tefilas Bereshis. Why don't you put? The answer is is if you didn't do it till now, don't say oh, I'll wait till next year. I'll wait till Simul Steyer. No, start now. The school could start from now also. Hashem will be happy if we do it now from Shmais too. We get a second chance. Be Sedra. Start now. Don't wait till next time. We thank you so very much for being part of this year. Wherever you're listening from, wherever you're watching from, whether you're on Kal Lushen, Torah Anytime, Facebook, Torah Communications Network, my digital subscribers, 718-916-3100. Thank you, and have a wonderful Shabbos.